Good afternoon and welcome to Nordic Welfare Center and this webinar on tactile language. My name is Maria Kreutz. I work with the deaf plan issues at Nordic Welfare Center, and I have the honor to be the host for this webinar today. Nordic Welfare Center is an institution under the Nordic Council of Ministers, and we work with different uh, welfare issues. Um, disabilities is one of them, and within that field, we have deaf blind issues as a, uh, a specific topic. We have five different networks in the deafblind field. Uh, most of them are connecting to congenital deafblindness, but we also have some work uh, around Usher syndrome. If you uh, want to know more about our deafblind work, you are most welcome to visit our website and you can also contact me or Nina if you want to know something more. One of those networks I mentioned is about tactile language. And uh, two years ago, we published a book. If you can see it, you can support it. It uh, remains 19 different chapters. And during this spring from January until now, we have had four different webinars. So this is the last, but of course not the least. We have gone a bit deeper in four different chapters, and now we're going to, to have this uh, fifth one. You can order the book for free and you will find it in the chat, the link for, for ordering the book. You can find it in English version and uh, Scandinavian version. And if you now think that, oh, it's a pity it's over, those five webinars, they went so quick and now it's over. We have uh, happy news for you because we are going to continue this autumn. So in October, November and December, there will be some more chapters that we are going a bit deeper in. More information about that, you, you can find that on our website later on. With that said, now we're going to have the, the last one this, um, for this uh, season. And today we will welcome Joe Gibson, one of the authors. He has written chapter number 11 in the book. If you can see it, you can support it. And today he will take us with him uh, for, for some more knowledge and explaining about the title language development on in the tactile modality through outdoor activities. Welcome, Joe. Nice to see you. How are you? Thank you, Maria. I'm good. Thank you. Excited to be here. Yes, me too. I think we, we will start at once. And as Nina said, just feel free to write uh, reflections or questions in the chat, and then we will have a uh, have 10 minutes approximately in the end that we can have some small talk with Joe with your uh, reflections and questions. So please, good Joe, good to go now, Joe. Okay, thank you, Maria. And thank you, NBC. And thank you for the, the uh, Tactile Language Network for inviting me to write a chapter um, in the book. Uh, if you can see it, you can support it um, a few years ago. And then for being able to have the opportunity to present uh, my chapter in a bit more depth today. As Maria said, my name is Joe Gibson. As you can see on there, I, on the screen, I work for Stapped in Norway at uh, the Amonten School or the Diamond School, which some of you may have known previously as Skodalen School. So that's where I'm working at the moment. I previously worked in Scotland for Scent Scotland uh, for nearly 20 years. I was the outdoor activities coordinator and worked in a supported house and a night shift worker, lots of different jobs in Scotland. And I'm also currently the coordinator for DBI Deafblind International's Outdoor Network. So that's a little bit about where I'm coming from. What am I going to talk about today? I'm going to have a little bit of an introduction and then I'm going to look at why outdoor activities, why I think they're important. And then a little bit of theory uh, on uh, outdoor activities and language development, tactile language development. 
And then I want to look at uh, some of the practical aspect, aspect, aspects, how we can maximize the potential of this language development during the activities. And then I'll finish with a case study. And then hopefully I'll leave enough time that there's, and I hopefully inspire that there, you that there's enough uh, time and ideas for questions and some discussion at the end. So uh, there in, in the book, if you've read the book, if you can see it, you can support it. There are lots of different theoretical models. Uh, and I feel uh, maybe a bit out of place when my chapter and my work, I, I think sometimes I just play, play games outside. But what I'm really interested in is uh, what can we talk about? Uh, what 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 can we what, what subjects can we have for the talking? There's all the theory, but what can we what can we talk about? And why outdoor activities? Well, first of all, when when I was working in Scotland uh, with predominantly with adults who were congenitally deaf blind, and we were doing some activities outside, and I saw things happening, and I wanted to try and understand why they were happening, and and to try and go a bit deeper. And in the end, transferred my my um, PhD research to focus on two of the two of the guys that I worked with. So that's the first first reason I was it was through curiosity, but also the reason we were doing these activities so often is that, is they are things that I like to do, uh, outdoor activities. And this this is maybe more important than you think. This is not just selfish, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later. Why why I think it's important. Uh, that we enjoy the activities that we choose. Sorry. So what activities do I mean when I talk about outdoor activities? When I talk about outdoor activities, I'm thinking of um, activities in and using the natural environment. In the, in the United Kingdom, in Scotland and England, you might call them outdoor pursuits. Uh, in Scandinavia, here we might call them frilliv activity activities. I'm thinking of things like canoeing and climbing and skiing, but it can also it doesn't have to be so high end activity. It can be things like taking a walk on the beach or in the forest, or gardening, or making dinner over a fire, or picking berries, or picking pine cones, or to anything outside using the natural environment is the type of activities I'm thinking about. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into that today. Also, uh, there are many benefits of these activities. Uh, and you can see this sort of mind map uh, matrix here. And I'm not going to go into all these different uh, areas today. But so you can see at the top there, they're divided into three broad categories of leisure, health, and in learning. Uh, and almost all of these different areas could have a whole day's uh, webinar. But today, we're going to focus on the, the communication, the learning to communicate, the language development, and why I think these activities are, are so good for the language development. Okay. Now some of the theory. These two models, the one on the left is came first in my, my thesis in 2005, and it developed into the one on the right, which I think was published a couple of years ago in an article with uh, Jude Nicholas, A Walk Down Memory Lane. But what I'm really interested in is the box in the middle. So I'll make that a bit bigger here. We can see these are the areas that I have found why I think the activities are so good at developing outdoor, uh, at developing language and developing communication. There's this stimulating activities, the nature of the activities in the outdoor environment and relationships. I'm gonna go, go through each of those and, and talk a little bit more uh, just now on why I think they're important. Starting off with the, the bottom left, the stimulating activities. They're authentic experiences you want to share, and you've got something interesting to talk about. Through the course of all of our days, we'll have lots of different things that will happen to us and that we might want to share to, with other people. But they tend to be the bigger things that we want to really share with somebody, things that are, that are important to us are often the things we've enjoyed doing 
or the things that we really haven't enjoyed doing. They're the things we want to tell other people about. And we don't necessarily want to tell them that I made a coffee and then I had a, and then I had a glass of water and then I sat down and did this. And I, I want to know, they want to know that when I put the washing machine on, all the fuses went, the lights went out, the big things that happened. So there, that's a key thing. And we'll, we'll come back to that and we'll talk a bit more about that when, when we go through the case study. The next thing is relationships. These, these activities we do in the outdoors very often are interactive and shared. And this is crucial because you need somebody to talk to. As it says here, language cannot happen in isolation. So we can use the activities that we've done together to start the conversation. Do you remember when you and I, when we did, and we were there together? Because we were there together, we might have more of a chance to, to recognize signs and gestures that have low readability. Often when we're working with people with, who are congenitally deafblind in particular, and they don't use formal signs for things, we're trying to develop the language and their language is limited. But if we were standing up to the waist in freezing cold water with them in the river, we might recognize the thing that they were doing to recount or remember that, that, that uh, experience. When we, we talk in the theory about bodily emotional traces, we will have also had some of these uh, bodily emotional traces on our bodies. So being there is, is, is a key factor. That being said, it's not always us who are the activity partners, that they, and the they being the deafblind uh, partner, want to talk about. So they don't always want to share the experience that we shared with us because we were there. They don't need to tell us about the, the thing that happened because we were there when it happened. I've had lots of experiences where the, the deafblind person that I've done something with doesn't want to talk to me about it, but they'll talk to the next member of staff or the family when we've gone home, which is understandable because because we, we did it. We don't need to talk about it. So that's a key thing to remember in the, in the how we um, maximize the potential by in passing passing on information. A bit more on the theoretical side on, on relationships and us as partners. From uh, Anna Nafstad and Inga Rodbro, we have to share his experiential space, however, in order to share his mental space. And we have to know his experiential world and as far as possible to share in it in actuality and imagination. This in turn is a prerequisite for joining him in the regulation of shared meaning in everyday dialogues. So here they're saying more or less what I said before, we need to be there to often to understand what, they're, what the person, the deafblind person is thinking when, they, when they're often presenting signs or gestures that aren't formal and have low readability. If we were the one there and they're tapping their knee and we might remember, oh yeah, we banged our knee when we were climbing up or uh, I banged my elbow on that, on that piece of equipment when the person's pushing their, up, their sleeve up to, to expose their elbow maybe we'll have more of a clue of, of recognizing what it is that they're trying to tell us. Also, Linnell uh, on, on dialogicality, uh, meanings of utterances in dialogue come from joint activities. So here we've got another theoretical sort of underpinning that, that we need to do these activities together for, for us to have more chance to understand the meaning. And thinking about relationships in my, my research, I came up with and talked about five different types of relationships that occurred during the activities that we were doing. And all of these give the opportunity for language development potential. So there's the relationships with the peers, the people that, uh, the other deafblind people doing the activities, uh, whether, they're, whether they live together or have just come together for the activity or at school together. There's a, there's a chance for them having done the activities together the same. They, they've shared the activity together. They might try it and want to talk to each other about the activities. There's the relationships with us as support staff. Um, not, there's, there's us, the direct support staff who might be the one working, but also the other support staff, maybe who they know or don't know as well. We had uh, various occasions in Scotland on some of the activity holidays where the, the deafblind adults had been 
on these and done the activities more often and several times than some of the sports staff. So they were in a in a novel position for them that they understood more what was happening. And uh, I'll never forget on one one time we were caving, and one of the deaf blind guys who'd been several times to this caving area took one of the members of staff who'd never been by the hand and led them into the cave. They were being led by the deaf blind person into the cave where we were going caving. And that was quite a powerful uh, moment for me watching, uh, I'm sure for the deaf blind person as well. There's also the relationships with external professionals. Um, the people that we often use as instructors in climbing walls or in the riding halls, if we go and use horse riding or sailing to help us with sailing or whatever the activity might be. There are people who are, who are not necessarily deafblind specialists, but bring other skills and, and they can often uh, have very interesting relationships because they're not uh, often the, the deafblind people realize that they're not their care worker, but they're, they're somebody else who's, who has a use and is interesting, whether it be because of their ability with the activity with climbing or as a carpenter, for example. There's also the relationships with the public. Uh, for, for a long time, a lot of the people I worked with were um, in, in Scotland, were in long stay hospitals, and locked, in, locked in hospitals. And to suddenly be out in the public and doing activities in the public, and for people to see, the general public to see these people who were uh, quite obviously had, had complex disabilities and were using different methods of communication to then climb up the wall often better than they could was very powerful both for the for the deaf blind person and for the public to see these guys in a po positive uh, light so that was a very interesting relationship and, and something we explored a bit further and finally the relationship with the environment um, it's easy for us to watch tv programs or read books about the environment and learn about the environment that way for people who are deaf blind really the only way they can learn about the rabbit living in a hole is to go and explore the rabbit hole. So they, they need to, to develop their relationship with the environment by being in the environment and often by getting on their hands and knees and getting your hands dirty and exploring the environment that way. So there's all these other types of relationships that are, that are, are, are possible and, and all give the, the opportunity for language development. Then there's the activities themselves and the environment, this natural environment where, where we're operating. They, I think, give uh, a way to talk. So we've got the, something to talk about with the stimulating activities. We've got the someone to talk to because you were there and you recognize what happened. And also the activities lend themselves to, to being recreated in, in big, gross physical gestures. So I was climbing or you and me were climbing. We were canoeing together. We were skiing down the slope. We were in the boat that was going up and down. So the activities themselves have lots of big bodily movements that we might recognize if they come as a gesture or we can use if we're trying to talk about them. There's also, also lots of equipment which, which can mark, leave marks on our body in a tactile way. So we talk about harnesses and helmets. Um, we can use skis and ski poles. Uh, yeah, lots of physical equipment and also lots of uh, things in the natural environment that are very tactilely interesting. So we've got stones that are hard. We've got trees we can talk about. We've got moss that's soft that we can squidge and, and feel. So they all feel very different. And as a, as a little aside, the, the natural environment, we can, we can use things in the natural environment to start to address more complex uh, issues um, beyond uh, language development sometimes, but things like young and old, dead and alive, big and small. We can use things like trees and bushes and animals in the natural environment to address some of these things just, just by exploring them and, and, and comparing. So we've got a way to talk using the activities and the natural environment. So I think that's more than enough uh, theory. Now I want to get into uh, what I'm more interested in is that, is that what do we do? What does this mean that we can do when we're actually out working and we're with people who are, who are deafblind supporting them to do some activities? And how can we make this 
uh, language development even more successful. The first thing we can do is nothing. We can just let the activities speak for themselves. And there's a whole um, debate in the outdoor education uh, sector on do we let the activities speak, speak for themselves, let the mountains speak for themselves, or do we um, facilitate everything and every little step? And we can, we can do the same working with people who are, who are deafblind. We can let natural signs emerge between the participants of an activity or from the participants themselves, or we can be proactive and facilitate um, before the activity, during the activity and after the activities. And to what level or to what extent we, we decide we want to facilitate and where we want to put our efforts to facilitate and where we want to stand back and let the activity speak for itself. These are all things that are not hard and fast. They'll depend a lot on the person that we're supporting and their experience of an activity and maybe the aims of the session as well. So let's go through each of these. Before, before we start doing an activity, we can, we can think about what does this activity mean? Does the person have any experience of it? Do we need to um, yeah, teach them <laughs> some, of the, some of the signs or uh, for them to become um, used to the equipment? And when we see the, the case study later on today, uh, I'm going to present, it's about a man climbing for the first time outside. Before we climbed outside, we first spent lots of time uh, playing with the equipment. So we played with the helmet and the harness and the rope in a, in a safe environment, nothing to do with climbing. We just sat and played with these, with the, the helmet, and put the harness on, put the helmet on, took it off, put it on, took it off played with the rope, tied knots in the rope, clipped the carabiners into the rope. So we played with the equipment. As well as scaffolding a, an understanding and a comfortability with the equipment, we, we scaffolded and developed a sign for climbing because we weren't sure what the, this uh, guy would understand by the sign climbing when we, when we uh, used it. So we started walking on the grass first and aiming for a slope, a grassy slope. And as it got steeper and steeper, and we had to go down onto our hands uh, and use our hands. And then we introduced the sign climbing because we were climbing up the grassy slope. And then we started to climb over uh, more rocky uh, terrain and we reinforced the sign climbing. You could do this in a gym. You could climb onto things. If, it, if it's climbing, you want to, uh, to um, build up the sign for climbing. We also went then one evening and we combined the equipment and the sign and we put the harness on and we clipped the rope into it and we used the sign climbing and we climbed together up a ladder with the rope attached so somebody was holding the rope so that he could feel that the rope as he went up was holding him tight and holding him tight and when he stepped off the ladder he didn't fall down. So we'd scaffolded up from the sign climbing and the familiarity with the equipment to the whole concept of why you use the rope and how the rope might work and how you would feel. So when we came to the, to the climbing crag, um, he would be more comfortable with all that and it, all the equipment and the sign weren't new. So there's that uh, example. Also, you can uh, uh, use the example of, of map reading and this you might uh, think is not something for people who are congenitally deafblind, but we can do this very tactilely. And first of all, the, the way I would begin is on a desk with people and we, we would put something on their table or their desk and make a little tactile model of it and then move around the desk, keeping the map, the tactile map uh, orientated to the desk. So the thing, the cup that we put in one corner is always in the right corner. And then you can move up from the table to a room and then from a room to a house. And I have done this with, with uh, a lot of the guys in Scotland and then move to the area around their house, trying to find tactile markers that we can, we can use in our map, but getting up from a very small, easily understandable thing on the table to an area they understand before going off to an area that was maybe new, and you can use a tactile map for that. However, something to remember is this can take a lot of time. Um, we had, when I was working in Scotland, uh, one particular school that came to the climbing wall that I was able to work with. And there was one young guy that came for uh, all these visits with the school, 
but it wasn't until the fifth visit that he actually climbed. In the first week, he just ran around the climbing wall. The next week, he put the helmet on and ran around the climbing wall. The next week, he put the helmet and the harness on and ran around the climbing wall. And the fourth week was when he put the helmet and the harness, helmet and the harness on, ran around the climbing wall, and just as they were about to leave, ran into where we were climbing and started to climb. And I had to tie the rope on quickly as he was climbing up the wall. But that was, uh, if uh, a lot of people maybe wouldn't have thought to keep bringing him, they might have stopped after the first attempt to say, okay, climbing's not for him, he's not so interested. But in talking with the staff and we decided, no, we'll bring him each week, we'll be patient and we'll let him become familiar with this new place because that's something else that might need to be scaffolded. The, the area, the place that you're doing the activity, you might need to build up a, a familiarity with the place as well as the, all the equipment and the, and the signs. So also, I think it's important that we consider how we frame the activity. And by that, I mean how, how we um, sell the activity to the, the people we're, we're doing it with. Uh, it's a, a, a criticism, it's fair to say, of um, maybe old practice in outdoor centers in Britain that you used to have your climbing day and your canoeing day and your sailing day and you would drive to the climbing wall crag outside and you'd climb up and come down and move across and climb up and come down and climb up and come down and then you'd go back in the bus and go away and then you would drive the next day to your canoeing and you would canoe out to a, um, an island maybe and come back and this often for for guys who are congenitally deaf blind doesn't always work like that and i have an example of how that didn't work for, uh, on an outdoor holiday with um, some of the adults in Scotland where we were crossing a river and we spent an hour preparing all the ropes and everything and going across the river and sit and on a, on a Tyrolean and we all had wetsuits and harnesses on and we crossed the river and then walked back round over the bridge back down to the bus where we started and one of the guys who had a bit of vision you could see looking at the bridge and looking down at where all the ropes were we'd crossed the river and looking at me as if why have we just spent two hours crossing the river using the ropes when we could have walked across the bridge it wouldn't have taken much for us to have been dropped on one side of the river with the bus and the bus to park the other side. And then we have to get to the bus. That's how we sell the activity. We look, we need to get across over, over to the, and we don't use the bridge, we don't see the bridge. So, so sometimes we need to think about how, if we're doing climbing, do we have something at the top? Is there a reason we're going up somewhere? Can we make the activity into a journey? Then it fits into a story and it's easier to, to, to process along the high points and the low points of, of the activity. So they're things to think about before we do the activity. During the activity, if we've, if we've sold the activity using this storyline, then, then we maybe need to re reinforce the storyline as we go along and, and highlight some of the things that we think might be important uh, um, for a, in a conversation when we come back. So obviously we need to consider these uh, planned unexpected events. If we're gonna come up to a, a, a stone wall and oh no, how are we gonna get up? The lunch is at the top of this wall. We need to think about how, how we're gonna do that and plan that. But we also need to be prepared for unexpected, unexpected events. So events that are unexpected to us, not just the events that we pretend that are unexpected. So we need to prepare for those, be prepared for those because often they're the things because we feel them as well. This is when we get back to the relationship of us having the same feeling. We're also in that state of cognitive dissonance and, oh, I'm not sure what's going to happen here. It might be more exciting to talk about that than the planned thing that we talked about. And in the light of that, we as, as facilitators and pedagogues, we need to be prepared to adapt and change our plans. And I know that can be difficult when we've got, especially as a teacher now, when we have these long lesson plans of what it is we're going to do. But often the... Uh, uh, deafblind pupil has a whole different idea and plan for the day. Uh, one, one thing we can think about of doing um, that comes both from the deafblind world and the outdoor education world, in the outdoor education world they call it to punctuate significant events. Uh, and we might talk about marking events in the, in the deafblind world. When we see something that we think is important and that has happened, that we, we make a gesture or we do a sign or we mark on the body where that thing has happened. 
to try and help the person remember when, when it comes to talking about it later on. Uh, so that's uh, something else that we can do during the activities. If we keep our eyes and be aware of things that might happen that we can then mark with the deafblind partner. And, I, and the over under tree example I talk about, uh, I've written about there. Some of you may have seen a video before. I used to do a session with a guy in Scotland where we would go and explore the forest, but we would always start and finish at the same tree that had these two branches that we would first climb over and then under. So the over under tree was our, was our very concrete tactile marked place that we would always begin and finish and have our, have our cup of tea at the end. So after, after the activities, Afterwards, we can retell and share the experiences. Um, and we can often do that as, as straight afterwards, sort of in the car before we go back. And it might be worth talking through the, what's just happened as soon as possible. And also the next day or later on, it can be interesting to see how long things last in the memory. And when, when we talk, talk about it, what things come up as a, as a subject with the deafblind person. And also uh, often we might want to wait and see what comes up for them. Um, we need to remember, and it, it might be, uh, yeah, we need to remember that it's not always that we, the things that we have marked that are, are the important thing to the partner. Um, you know, we'll see a bit of that in the, in the case study where, where I didn't notice the thing that, that was being marked the whole way through the activity by the deafblind person. And I had my idea that we were going to talk about certain things, and that wasn't what we uh, ended up talking about. So when we're retelling and sharing the experiences, we need to think about what it is we want to share and also who we want to share it with. Um, I said before how sometimes it's not us as the activity partner that always is the person who, who the deafblind partner wants to share with. So we might need to think about who are the key people that I want to share what happened with um, family members or key staff or yeah siblings whoever it might be that we want to tell and how do we want to tell them do we, is there pictures we can show them is there can we show them signs that we use during the day is there film we can show them and also how do we want to share it these experiences we can tell a story and we can show videos but that's not so much coming from the deafblind person they can talk to us or talk to other people but also they can, uh, I was very lucky in Scotland, I was able to work with the arts team. Um, and there was one example and a big significant event that happened with one of my um, uh, people I was working with where his shoe came off in the mud when we were in the forest. And it was a big drama. And luckily I noticed after a while that the shoe was off and we made a big drama of going back and finding the shoe in the mud. Didn't, I didn't need to pretend because I was worried that I was going to get uh, told off when I came back to the house with no shoe and uh, one shoe of this guy. And eventually we found the shoe and I, I shared this story with one of the art tutors and after uh, a long period they ended up making a sculpture of this whole experience of this wooden shoe in the mud. We did a bit of work on the, there were mountain bike uh, tracks before so we took a mountain bike wheel and we made tracks, we made a barefoot print we made some shoe footprints lots of things uh, to talk about it's very tactile and uh, the deafblind person can feel it and talk about it i think he actually got fed up with talking about it every time i met him i would want to talk about do you remember you and me your shoe off in the mud and uh, i think he got a bit bored with the whole uh, the whole subject but this also opens up now lots of people have seen this sculpture hanging in, in uh, touch base in glasgow and now want to talk to him about this activity or this, this experience that he's had. So it's a way that he's been able to share his experience with other people. So, on to this case study. Uh, it's a film that I'm sure some of you will have seen before. It's of uh, a man who is referred to as Fred in my thesis and in the articles. He's uh, congenitally deaf blind, and in this film, he's climbing for the first time. Uh, the video is old, it's from 1997. It is not the best quality because it was pre digital video. It was also shot as a holiday video and not collected as part of the research. It was before the actual my research started, but it's as so often is the case, these unplanned things are the best things. And I'm still talking about it and using it 24 years later. 
Um, and there's no audio on the film, or I've I'm turning the audio off because there's just a lot of wind, and then occasionally they do use his real name. So I've turned the audio off. So we'll watch uh, the film, and then we'll go through a, a very brief analysis of it using the criteria or the things that I've just been talking about. Okay, I'll, I'll talk back through the film now, going looking at these three uh, three elements that I think regarding the activities and, and why and how they uh, influence in this video. First of all, first of all, the stimulating activity for Fred. You probably saw that for him, help the helmet was interesting. That was the thing he was interested in several times as you can see on the picture on the left where he's touching it but there's there's many occasions during the climb that he was feeling and, and exploring his helmet which i didn't see at the time and also i was very no this is the way you climb you put your hand on the rock here i'm quite strict and not very good deaf blind uh, pedagogue uh so but we'll come back to that as well in a minute um for me the uh, immediately afterwards, obviously, the, the moment of hand biting and uh, what caused that was interesting. Or uh, immediately afterwards, it was the moment when he pushed back and I had to grab the rope was the powerful moment for me, the stimulating activity uh, for me. But it was the, the going back and trying to find what caused that. And um, there's an article that I wrote with Fleming and some of you may have seen or read about uh, called Comfort Zone, but it's actually about the space between us that goes through almost frame by frame and looks at, at that incident um, where you can see what caused, uh, as he became more confident and got further away from me, um, and then something happened and then I wasn't there. 
Um, so there was there was lots of different things that were stimulating about this activity, and I'm, I'm sure that was a moment for for Fred also. Um, so there were different elements that were very stimulating within that activity. Our relationship, despite my my um, bad pedagogical uh, approach of of being very strict, uh, didn't seem to have an impact on the, our relationship. In fact, it had a uh, I didn't have a negative impact. It had a very big impact in, uh, and you could see that um, he came back to me very quickly and was me, he was looking for, and, it, um, and was not angry towards me, but but hugged me and we climbed up the rest of the climb in, almost in, in that uh, manner with him hanging on me like that. Uh, and that's, uh, yeah, oh, that's what I'll say about that just now. And as I've said, there was the, the helmet. We can see several pictures there of, of Fred exploring his helmet. And uh, the harness uh, was obviously important. The movements we could use, but also the rope. The rope was significant because it was the rope that went across his face that caused him to be uh, upset and reach back for me. So there was, there was lots of things about the activity that I could bring back afterwards and, and discuss with, with, uh, with Fred afterwards. <laughs> So to go through the before, during and after, uh, the before I've, uh, I've talked about before how we scaffolded up the side of the climbing and the action and the equipment and how we built up to that. So I don't need to go through that again. We built up to that so that when we came outside and side of the climb, he almost started to climb uh, naturally. And we picked a climb that was very simple and also was quite blocky. So you stood up onto a, a rock and then you could stand quite easily and feel the next bit and feel where you have to stand stand up next so it was like climbing on a series of boxes almost rather than just a flat wall which is maybe a bit more intimidating now when you're just going by feel um during i missed uh, a lot his interest in the helmet and maybe that was fred marking <laughs> telling me when we when we finish i'm going to talk about this this is the thing that's interesting for me however uh, oh, yeah, and also I was quite um, not non-deafblind pedagogical in that I wasn't focused on the thing he was interested in. I was focused on what I was interested in, in that when we climb, we hold on to the rock and we don't take our hands off and, and play with our helmet. But there was maybe something about the fact that I was overly strict and enthusiastic about this activity um, that maybe overcome the, overcame the the bad deafblind practice. And that's what I said before, if we're, if we're uh, fans of an activity and we like an activity and a very intimate activity, that can often be, uh, often help when it comes to um, selling the activity to the person that are bodily, we're enthusiastic about something. And maybe that was the case uh, here with Fred. He, he could feel that, that, okay, there's some rules about this, this climbing game that uh, I need to keep my hands on the rock and not talk about the helmet now but uh, I'll try and he kept trying me um to mark this for later and then after okay now we've got a little bit of time still so I can show you this next film is a short section of a film from a conversation we had after that climbing again it's uh old and, and not the best quality and there's sound I've taken I will take down uh, because it's not good quality and I don't talk. I was still in my bad um, pedagogue stage of not talking while I was signing. You can also see I began, I'll talk, I'll play and talk at the same time, I think. Is Peter's reaching, uh, Fred is reaching around for me and he's signing, want sign, you sign helmet. And then with fingerspell, he was very into fingerspelling, H-E-L-M-E-T. I'll just pause it here. We, we had already been in this session for about 10 or 15 minutes, um, which, and it lasted for like half an hour, which for him was a huge amount of time to be, to be engaged. And it took me this long to realize it was the helmet was the thing that he was interested in. So still I was, he, he he, uh, Fred, he is um, persevered with me. 
he was very patient with me in my not understanding during the climb and not understanding afterwards that the helmet was the thing that he wanted to talk about. But now I've realized, so we reach and get the helmet together and he puts it on. And he reaches around a couple of times for me, which I don't uh, respond. And he gets a bit angry about that. And then he realizes I am there and we put the helmet on. And we, I do the buckle up, but he's got hold of my both hands and he now both hands on one hand and he doesn't let go until I've undone the buckle. And then he's passed the helmet away and then he sign, says sign helmet. You and I sign, you want sign helmet, H E L M E T, helmet. And we reach for the helmet again. And he tries to put it on himself. And we put it on and buckle it up. You want me to buckle it up. And this time he's let go of one of my hands and let me sign to him, you climbed and I've tried to reach for the climbing shoes and he is not at all interested. And we go back to the helmet buckle. On, on reviewing and going through this video and talking to some of the staff who'd known Fred for a, a long time and his history, he had had, it, had a, a period where he'd had a padded helmet put on him forcibly. Um, and in this session, we, as you saw, uh, he wouldn't let go of my hands while the, the buckle was done up and slowly we had a bit longer and a bit longer of, under, of, of leaving it buckled up the helmet and I began to think okay maybe he's building up that this is a different helmet he's, he's reassuring himself this is a different helmet and I was very keen that he would always have control of this helmet and he could take it off whenever he wanted and in the end this developed into his sign for finishing climbing we would be on the climbing wall and he would take my hands to the buckle and we would come back down. Even if we hadn't started climbing, it, it was his way of finishing uh, the climbing, which he would test in lots of different ways. But uh, I think it was a very important power, uh, development of power for him in, in, in being able to control an activity, as well as me finally understanding what it was that he was interested in. Um, I was just a bit slow. So, to conclude, I think there are, there are things we need to consider when, when choosing activities. We need to think about, is there something interesting to talk about here? Is it an authentic, real feeling that we want to share with somebody or with the deaf blind person wants to share with somebody? Because that's what we need to have, things that have come from inside us that we want to share. Is there, is there someone who, who we can share the experiences with or who might recognize elements of the of the experience and is there a way that we can talk about the things that we want to from the activity is there a way from the equipment we use or the movements we use in the activity or the environment where we're doing the activity uh, that lend themselves to being um, to becoming a way of talking a tactile way of talking and then there are things that we can do to maximize this, this language development before, during, and after the activity. So 
I, I don't know if there's any questions, but I, I would be very interested if anybody has any experience of using activities like this in language development or has activities they think are particularly suitable for language development or are interested in outdoor activities in any way. I'm interested in, in all of these things if anybody wants to share, uh, share that. And I see you're back, Maria. So that is me finished. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for this interesting presentation. And uh, although I have seen the film uh, quite a lot of times, but it's so <laughs> interesting, very, uh, every time it's so interesting and you see new things. We have a, a comment. Uh, thank you for uh, inf an informative presentation. It's so important to be aware of setting the frame and the unexpected things that might happen, which might lead to exciting possibilities for something to talk about. Uh, and you lifted it up that it was the helmet uh, and you didn't realize it first. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for in, in that uh, particular activity, it was the... Uh... Yeah, it was the helmet. I, I I thought getting to the top would be a big the big thing, but for him it was the uh, and and in hindsight thinking back, the harness and the helmet, these sort of constrictive pieces of equipment with his history were, were very important and maybe the things that were big moments for him. Yeah, and now we have. Uh, thank you for that. Joe. Now we have another question. First, thank you for sharing. Do you have experiences of outdoor activities with people who are who are deaf blind, but also have severe motor impairments? Uh, yeah, um, we at the school now. We we are very lucky. We have a climbing wall in the school, and we have ten pupils, some of whom are uh, wheelchair users and very limited. Uh, in their physical movements and abilities, but all 10 of them have sessions at the climbing wall. In fact, today was a climbing wall day. I, I missed the climbing wall day today to do this oh. presentation. <laughs> but there, yeah, we can, we can, there are things you can do, whether it's exploring the wall or using adapted harnesses um, to, to be hoisted up and then explore the wall with your foot or your elbow or your forehead or your back or whichever the piece of your body that you prefer with regard to climbing. There are other activities going into the forest and going for a walk in a, somebody who's a wheelchair user going off the path. Mm. That can be fantastic, just the movement and the bumping on a not smooth path. You don't have to go very far off the path for it to be rough. If you're able to get out of the wheelchair, um, either using a mobile hoist or if there's enough people to lie on the ground in the forest, mm. the soft uh, leaf mulch and the light coming through the trees and I've often said when when the, the new um, centre was built in Glasgow, and they spent and, and the same in the school uh, we were in a new a new building our school, and we both the, the centre in Glasgow and the school have these sensory rooms that are, are not cheap, and lots of uh, lights and and different uh, sensory apparatus, and I've always said I can take the guys out into the woods for nothing, and we can lay on the soft floor and feel all the different uh, leaf mould underneath. And we have the wind coming through the trees and we have the way the, the leaves move from the trees and the different insects that come and we can explore without moving. Mm. So we have, there are lots of things you can do with people of all different physical abilities. Mm. Good. And I know that you have more than 20 years of experience, experiences of, of this. So I assume that you have tried and uh, with try and, and error <laughs> yeah, yeah. and then try again, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah, yeah, and it, and I think that's often the case is to, is is to know the person that you're working with, but then just to try and to be open to try anything and everything. Mm. And I, I would really encourage all of you to to read this chapter because then you you I think that you could might get some good ideas of what to do and just to to have the guts to to dare to do it to try new things. I think that's a, a, it's a very inspiring. And uh, Lex Grandia, he, he was, uh, he's not with us anymore, but he was a former president of the World Federation uh, for the Deaf Blind. And I, I remember that he said once that he, well, as soon as he had grown up and could make his own decisions, he, he decided 
not to ever, ever walk, uh, just take a walk outside again, because that's what he had been doing all his childhood when he was growing up. They just went walking because we think that, oh, it's nice to take a walk. And I hated to take a walk, but to do things that you are talking about in the outdoor activities, that's totally different. Yeah, and I think it doesn't have to be climbing. Climbing is a big, uh, nice to see on the videos and a big uh, highlight event. But mm -hmm. to walk in the park on the tarmac path, you, mm -hmm. you might as well be walking down the street in the high street. Mm -hmm. But to step off the tarmac, you don't have to go very far into the forest. You don't have to go to the, the north of Norway or uh, the Amazon or wherever it might be. You can be, you can, we can still see the path. But if mm. we're off and the ground is not concrete, not flat, and there are interesting things we can start to explore just by stepping off the path. Yes. And we, we have had uh, two courses in Sörmodalen in Norway uh, where we really tried to do these uh, outdoor activities. We practiced them. And I remember from one of the courses that two, uh, two of the participants, they said, that, OK, we are going to try to tent out in our garden uh, because we have no possibilities to, to go away so far. But we will tr uh, tent out in the garden uh, at uh, the the young man with deaf blindness outside his home. Uh, and I think that was so nice just to, to grab everything of the theories and uh, of the, the framework and everything and say, okay, we'll try in the small way. That's, that's perfect. That's, that's that is scaffolding. That is starting off somewhere that's comfortable and you can go in and use the toilet if you need to. You can, you can come back and uh, if it all goes wrong in the night, uh, we, we did that with some of the guys in Scotland before they came to Norway and slept outside on a holiday. We'd slept, yeah. I'd slept outside in the tent in their garden with them. So yeah. the sleeping bag wasn't a new thing. The sleeping on top of the grass wasn't a new thing. The sleeping in, under the tent wasn't a new thing. Yeah. Uh, so, it's, yeah, I think that's a, you can start small and, and build up and build up and build up in the same way as you would with very young children, starting very small so they can deal with the concepts. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a, a great way. That's very inspiring. You can start small and then you can build it bigger and bigger. And with that said, I think that uh, we shall close this webinar for today. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Startpad and Diamante School for, for giving, giving us the time with you. And as I said before, in October, November, December, we will have three more uh, webinars uh, on this book. If you can see it, you can support it. And you can meet Joe and his colleagues again the 2nd of June when he will talk about another book, Revealing Hidden Potentials. And that's uh, the chapter on climbing the wall with video analysis about cognition in relation to congenital deaf blindness. Welcome back whenever you uh, want to. And thanks, Joe. Thanks for today. Take care, everyone. See you again.